Anyway, we're going to open up in prayer, and then we'll get started. Dearly Father, I thank you so much for the ones here today, and uh, those who listen online, I uh, super appreciate them as well, and just want to pray a special blessing on everyone today. Help us to hear what you've got to say to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the things I've been working on a project, and I've talked about it some, and this one thing, I don't know where I picked it up, probably some yard sale somewhere. It's a yardstick, all right? Let's just start there. It's made of metal. And it's four feet long, tall. So oftentimes what I'll do for it, I like it because it's metal, so you can take it out, in the, out in the, and I'll measure snow on the back deck with it, is what I do with it a lot of times, so in the wintertime. So I like it because if it gets wet, it's not going to warp or anything like that because it's made of steel. Well, I've had it out when I'm digging on this uh, project. I have to make the footers three feet deep and 14 inches wide as a target. So it's nice. I just keep it right with me. I just keep checking as I'm digging through. Not only at 35 inches, it's got to go down a little bit further. And I'll just pull it out next to me because now at this point you're standing in this trench you're digging. And I'll just make sure it's got that 14 inches. And I refer back to it like constantly. Like I, it goes with me as I dig that trench and I move along. That yardstick is, measure, is going right along with me. It's the check to make sure. That is the value of the Word of God. It's a constant check back to where am I at? Where am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to be thinking? Because there's a truth to it. And a lot of times we've got to remember this. There are a lot of thoughts out there. And sometimes we, even ourselves, can get confused in our own thinking. You've got to constantly be willing to come and check back. I talked to someone just this last week. Check back to the truth. But this, 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 listen, what is the truth? What does the Bible say about what you're going through right now? And I was able to actually share some of the verses that I'm going to go over right now with them to help them. And I said, you have to constantly remind yourself of what the truth is. That Bible is, in essence, the yardstick that I'm constantly like, I take with me everywhere in my thinking to make sure, hey, am I on what I'm supposed to be, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Now, the challenge today, I say this is the end of 1 John. So we've been, I feel like I just started the book. I mean, we're, we're done it today. So I'm looking at these last final verses, and constantly he's told these people, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. So that's a common word in the book. I want you to know. And the challenge is to be encouraged because God's got your back, and that's what he wants us to know. And we start off in verse 18 of 1 John 5. We know that God protects We've got to know that, that God is going to protect us. In verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God, that's Jesus, keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. Now that's a lot right there. If you're, number one, born of God. If you are, patterns of sin are broken, and Jesus is protecting you from harm. He's protecting you from the evil one. I think all that's ultra, ultra, ultra significant. So let's take a look at this. All right, we know that God protects us, and we have this blessing of being born again, really, because it says that you're born of God. I don't see that any differently than what John, John talked about to Nicodemus, saying you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, right? So there's a spiritual birth and a rebirth that happens when you put your faith in Christ, and everything in our spiritual lives hinges from that. If you don't, like all the stuff that we're talking about is not going to work if we don't have faith in Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins, and we are not, in essence, born again. That, that's where everything is hinging off of this right here, right? Those who are born of God. And it says in Titus 3, 4, and 5, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So I, I look at this and say, okay, well, there's this washing of rebirth, the spiritual birth, and this renewal by the Holy Spirit. And I look about how powerful, or look at how powerful that is in your life. Renewal. What do I have in my spiritual life when I'm connected with God? Rebirth. Renewal. Restoration. And so when I look at this and say, yeah, my spiritual connection with God, when Jesus Christ leads me to being born again, there, there's a lot of strength here. There's a lot of hope here. Well, wait a minute now. 
if, if I'm born again, I can overcome things. I've got like this extra turbo that other people just aren't going to have. Like I have a power to overcome anger, addiction, all kinds of stuff because of my connection with him. And it clearly indicates a kinship with God the Father. If you're born of God, yeah, who's that? This is the architect of the universe. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's pretty massive. Like, that's pretty huge what we believe that we're connected. We're born of God. We're actually now put into a kinship, adopted as God's children, the one who made all things that we see. And all the stars you see at night and all the beauty around you, he made all that stuff. And I think about the power of that, that I'm born into God's family. Now, if I, by the way, I don't have... Like, uh, I have a TV. I don't have TV stations because I didn't feel like paying for it this year because I decided I didn't want to watch the Browns. If I'm not watching the Browns, well, that's the only thing I really see on the NFL. And the only reason I have TV stations is to watch the NFL. You know what I'm saying? So once I don't, I don't have, I don't have it. So am I watching uh, coverage, let's say, of other things going on in the world, like the funeral of Queen Elizabeth? No. Like, I don't see it. But I read some of the headlines, and I read there was, like, this flap between the two brothers, William and Harry, because one, he got to wear this insignia, this ER, Elizabeth Reginald, Regina insignia that was on his shoulder, and then Harry pulls out his uniform, where's mine? You know what I mean? I mean, they're brothers, but you know, when you grow up, I guess there's a question, where's mine? You know, how come? Well, you know, maybe, Harry, it's because you walked away from the royal family, Right? Maybe because there are certain things that you do. And so here, these guys are, I have this on my shoulder. I don't have this on my shoulder. And this is like a royalty problem. You know what I mean? This is not a problem we're ever going to have. Like, this is not a discussion we're ever going to have, right? Because this is what happens. I think about these guys. Man, the privilege, the power, the influence of being born in that family. And by the way, as an American, I don't, I don't have no it doesn't bother me if you guys are into that. I don't care if somebody watched it for 48 hours straight. I just don't care. Never did. Do you know what I'm saying? My whole life, I've never cared one thing about it. But the world sure does, and the Princess Diana days, and the kids days, and coming along, and these days, and who's doing these things, and it's like a soap opera, right? Because they're so interested in their lives because of who they are. And the, the thing of who they are has everything to do with the family they were born into, right? And because they're part of that family, there's certain privileges and blessings and all kinds of things that go along with that. And then I think about, and by the way, I mean, Queen Elizabeth, people probably sat around for hours watching the coffin being toted down the streets. How many people watch that? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Oh, there's one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Get out. No, I'm just kidding. So... We, we, have, right, we have one person. So you watch it, right? I, I would say, I would estimate millions, right? Millions, millions, millions of people watch this. Go on. Take my casket down the street. No one's going to care. You know what I'm saying? Take your casket down the street. No one's going to care. I promise you, there's not going to be millions of people watching that. And why are they watching this? Because they're royalty. Spiritually, so are you, Right? Because you're connected back with God's family and all the privileges. I mean, born of God, I mean, that feels good. And John 3, 3, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. They have the spiritual rebirth. And that all comes through basic things that we believe. We, I believe we're all sinners, like every single one of us. Not picking on anyone. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Because of that, I mean, we're sinking. We, we exit this world, man, we're going to sink like a rock. Because there's no way for us to get to heaven on our own. The only way for us to get to heaven is Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. So when you realize that, because in this whole conversation with Nicodemus where, you know, you must be born again, is also the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the start of all things right there. Do I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son who died on the cross for my sins, rose again on the third day? Is that where my faith is? It says when we believe, then we're saved. Our sins are forgiven. We have a home in heaven. We have the spiritual rebirth, which brings all kinds of awesome things. We're literally co-heirs with Christ. And part of the passage, uh, there was one passage read today, 1 Peter 1, 
3 through 5. Now, this is Peter. He was also, right, a disciple with Christ, and he traveled along with John. And he said this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish. Spoiler fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You all, through faith in Christ, have what? An inheritance. And you're shielded by God's power, privileges of being born again. Inheritance, hope for a better day, protection from God, all based in this one thing. And I love it. And so he says these people that are born of, of God in verse 18 of 1 John 5 do not continue to sin, which means this, <clears throat> that when I'm connected with God and I'm part of God's family, I, I walk like it, I talk like it, I live like it, I conduct my marriage like it, all, everything's like that, right? I'm, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to be thinking about what He wants me to do. And I, I think about the differences that Christ makes in a person's life legitimately, makes and how it does change our thinking because we come to the Bible and we see the Reformation, we see a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Christ said so much in the Sermon of the Mount alone, it's just in that one piece, that, that three-chapter section in the book of Matthew, 5, 6, and 7, says so much. And then Jesus Christ will be talking about things like marriage. And I think of Christ and, and what a high view of marriage he had. You know, what what impacts me as a Christian? High view of marriage. Why, why would I have a high view of marriage? Jesus had a high view of marriage. Living in a day when you could divorce your wife for any reason, living in a day where they would change out wives like we would change out decoration and think nothing of it. And in that day, and, and, and encountering those people with that bad thinking about marriage, and he, and he said to them that, you know what? God, what God has put together, let no one tear apart. Remember those words? That to me, when I look at Christianity, I look, yeah, well, that's part of it. The, these words of Christ, what, what God has put together, let no one tear apart. And so I, I see this internal working of God when you put your trust in Him and the direction and the strength and strengthening we have. Paul said it in Romans 6, count yourselves dead to sin because it's not your boss anymore. Again, you won't continue on sinning. It's not your boss. You've got a power to overcome these things. This is what the Bible's teaching. So lust is not your boss, and anger is not your boss, and immorality is not your boss. Hatred is not your boss. Like, none of these things have any power over you. In Galatians 5, 16 through 17, same chapter where we find the fruit of the Spirit, it says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict to one another. So you're not able to do whatever you want. You can't do whatever you want, right? Because we're walking by the Spirit. If we walk by the Spirit, we'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's a lot of strength. Now, I'm about to give an analogy that I think is, is extremely profound. Why, okay, why are these sin patterns getting busted in my life? Because it says you're born of God, you're not going to continue on in these same sin over and over and over again. Why? Why is it getting busted up in my life? Well, because when I believe in Jesus Christ, my sins go to Him, and what goes to me? His righteousness, right? It says that. It talks about that in the Corinthians, right? My sin is going to Him, His righteousness righteousness is coming to me. Now, here's the analogy. Take coffee. Coffee in and of itself, for a lot of people, doesn't taste that good. Do you agree with that statement? Not great. I don't mind. By the way, I don't mind black coffee. I will drink black coffee, but I also know, know this. A lot of people put sugar and cream it's not enough to have cream, then there's flavored creamers. There's all kinds, there's pumpkin spice time of year, right, in your coffee because you can't drink it straight black. Now, once you add, you take coffee, in and of itself, it's going to have a bitter taste, right, in and of itself. We 
add sugar to it, right? We add sugar into it. Once the sugar is added, that changes the taste of the coffee, does it not? You know full well when it has sugar, you know it does. You can't help but know it does. All you've done, look, all you've done, you didn't per se change that property. You, you added something into that. And what I'm saying is this, if we're like that cup of coffee in and of itself, a little on the bitter side, you know, in and of ourselves on the sinful side, and then when we become believers, he adds his righteousness into us. Once that righteousness is stirred into us, right, the people around the world, if they could sip you like a cup of coffee, don't taste that. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they don't sense that love, that joy, that peace, that kindness, that gentleness, that forbearance, that faithfulness, that self-control, all the fruit of the Holy Spirit, then I got to sense that. Do you see how profound these things are? We're talking about what we've talked about in this whole book about being born again, and you're going to love people, and you're going to do the right thing. You, you can't not. I'm telling you, if, if we are not, if we are walking and look just like the world, there is a major problem. If I taste like straight black coffee to the world, and they can't taste that spirit in me, there is something wrong like major league wrong, if they can't see it. You understand? we got some work to do. Maybe we got some faith issues that we've got to come back and re, I guess, designate our faith in Him. We also have, these are the things we have, we have God watching over us. The one who is born of God keeps them safe. It's very comforting, which means, what, the word means to watch over, to ward off, to guard, to keep, to protect. And I wonder... So many times, you know, how many times has God protected us? Like, how many times has God intervened? And spiritual forces that wanted to flood into your life and couldn't because God said no. I wonder, you know, protection. Our hands protect us from a lot of things coming at us. I watch my wife sometimes. She does not, when it, you get these warm fall days, yellow jackets are everywhere. I know they're around all summer, but you become delicious to them. I don't know why. Like, what is it about us? Like, they, they really want to land on you. To me, if a yellow jacket lands on me, I just don't care. You know what I mean? Because I know he just wants to come check me out, and he's going on his way. For my wife, she cares very much. So she's always, you know, see her swatting around. It looks like a bad kung fu movie, right? <laughs> but I will say this. There are no bees landing on those hands. You know what I'm saying? Not when they're moving that fast. And so I think about God protecting us at all times and making sure that we're okay. In John 17, 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. This is my prayer. So we experience God's protection. Now, I can only speak, you know, anecdotally at this point. I remember one day, and it was years ago, I was visiting somebody down off Mechanicsville. I was coming back up the Cork Cold Springs Road. I was looking left. The sun was setting. And all you see is the sun. And I'm telling you, in, I saw nothing. So I'm ready to pull out. And in that instant, between your brain saying it's okay and hitting the gas. And I mean, right there in that nanosecond, I saw a triaxle, the form of a triaxle dump truck coming out of the sun. I'm going to tell you what, I almost bit it that day because I was right ready to go. And I thought, I almost didn't come home tonight. Just on a simple visit, I mean, just a simple visit as a pastor, almost killed myself out there because I did not see that dump truck because the sun was right on the road. And I pulled out, I would have pulled out, I'm telling you, I, there would have been nothing anyone could have done about it. I would have been right out in front of them, and boom, it would have been that fast. I thank God for that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember that moment, like, God, thank you, thank you for helping me to see that. Like, I, I clearly didn't see it. I needed that. And so I appreciated his protection for me. So you look at it and say, yeah, God definitely, he's going to be protecting us. There have been other times where I felt that the Lord was protecting me from my own stupid self. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy anyway, right? The things that we conceive to do, things that we start to justify, and then God's waking us up. I really believe that one of the greatest allies that you have is your spouse. Like, how do I think God's helped me at times? Jerry, you know what I'm saying? Jerry harping at me about something and trying to help me to sit right? I appreciate it. I do. You know, I, I don't look at those things and say, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, that's a good way to view it. And, and I realize God's used her at times. I realize God's used other things at times. I put things in my life that just block my paths because he wanted me not here. He wanted me there. Protection. 
so that evil can't get hold of you. And he said, the evil one cannot harm them. It means it can't even touch you. Now, look, I wouldn't play games with evil. I wouldn't be playing with tarot cards. I wouldn't be playing with Ouija boards. I wouldn't be playing with psychics. I wouldn't be messing with any of this stuff. You guys have no idea what's out there. You have no idea what kind of hooks that can put in you. And he said, I wouldn't mess with it. But on the other hand, I realized, well, that stuff, that stuff really can't touch me. It's kind of like Jesus praying for Peter. Hey, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I prayed that he wouldn't. So how, how is Peter protected? By the prayer of Jesus Christ. So Satan wanted after him, but couldn't get there. Why? Because Jesus Christ was protecting him. Jesus Christ saw that, knew that, and was protecting him. I love that. I think a Kwame Medicor has told stories, and Kwame at some point in the next year is going to be actually here at church. And uh, he's a fascinating guy to talk to. Out and grew up in Togo, West Africa. From there, he said, Bill, all this voodoo stuff that goes on around us, because that's a big part of the... Um, cultural situation that he's in. He said all the curses and spells they put on people cannot work on Christians. Do absolutely not work. Once they're a believer, none of that stuff can touch them. And I think here, I'm like, well, that's the reality over there in Africa. It can't even touch them, and I appreciate it. But as Jesus Christ coached his men, I want you guys praying that you fall not into temptation. I would, I would pray about that and understand it can't harm me. So if there are times where you're scared and you're wondering, it's like, wow, can evil get hold of me? Can I be demon-possessed? Can I be... I'm, sometimes people ask me these kind of questions as a believer. No, no way. It's not possible, right? Yeah, you can... Somebody can be jabbering your ear. No one can make you do anything. No one's got control. You're not a puppet for evil. No way. Jesus said it right here. You're born of God. Sinful patterns are broken. I will protect you. Now, be encouraged. Right? If nothing else, if nothing else today, be encouraged. Like you go out and walk out that door today, be be confident and be encouraged that God is here with you. And we also know that we're led by God because verse 19 it says, We know that we are the children of God, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And basically, what it's saying here is this world that we live in is lying seriously, like lies, has its existence in the sphere of, of evil. That's a fact. We as believers are coming out. We're, we're coming out of that. And now we're, we're, somewhere, we're somewhere different, spiritually speaking. We're under the control of God, not evil. And I think about how destructive evil is and that it's not random. Like, evil's not just a concept. Like, this is evil one, like a person, personal, with intent, uh, with maliciousness, trying to keep the world in evil. And there is a power that is pushing to cut off contact with God that is not random. Now, by way of illustration, do you think that Russia and the citizens of that nation, under the influence of Putin, get the truth about what's going on in Ukraine? That does anyone in their wildest imagination think that that country wants anything to do with what the true truth is. No. They're going to give you the state-sponsored version of the truth. Because they don't want you to have the truth. They don't want their people to know what's going on. What I'm saying is, that's how Satan operates in this world too. You think Satan wants people getting truth about God? Getting connected with God? Absolutely not. You see it all the time where Satan's trying to point things out as False, just even in, in religion, gets attacked by this. Here's what people say. I just don't, you know what, I just don't believe in organized religion. And everyone's standing around them. Yeah, man, right on. Okay, do you not believe in organized education? Do you not believe in organized medicine? Do you not believe in organized sports? Do you not believe in, in organized law enforcement? Or do we believe in disorganized everything? Because the, the thinking that's out there that, that seems so sanctimonious, like so pious, I just don't believe in organized religion. Organized, like a church, like because we're organized, we can do celebrate recovery. Because we're organized, we can actually do a wanna clubs. Because we're organized, we can have a food pantry. Because we're organized, we can do Operation Christmas Child. Because we're organized, we can be involved in Halo. Because we're organized, we can do a community dinner. You couldn't do anything without like that without organization. It's one of the most nonsensical things that I hear. And yet people will allow that. They'll take that little statement, I don't believe in organized religion. See you, God. That's it. I mean, with that easy of a brush off, just... And Satan wins. 
with one little comment. That's one. There's bunches of them out there. Bunches about that. You ask people, I don't believe in the Bible is full of contradiction. Tell me one. Well, I don't know. That's what I heard. That's it. Like, that's what I heard. I'm like, have you ever read it? Like, have you ever come in? Have you ever looked? But of course, Satan doesn't want these people connecting with the truth. Satan wants these people away from the truth. Because the truth was going to set them free. And he hates it when people are coming out and following God. I mean, absolutely hates it. So I look at these things and say, yeah, we are absolutely God's kid. We are from God. He is inside. That is absolutely powerful. And we experience the true God in verse 20. It says, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Jesus Christ is. Right there, another divin- deity passage. He is the true God in eternal life. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. So Jesus Christ came to know so that we would know God. What is important to God? That you know him. That's important. And that you know he is the real deal. Now, to me, it's an interesting concept. You know, I try to wrap my mind around this, you know, actually knowing God, like me, a little finite Bill, trying to understand an infinite God. And it says here, you can know him. You can know, and I think about the way that people are coming to know God, and, and sometimes what they're seeing is this. It's a thirst. There's something within them stirred up, and they are thirsting for God. As the psalmist said, my soul longs for you. Like a deer is panting for the streams of water, so my soul longs for you. This is happening in people's lives. In a way, sometimes they can't even perceive, they can't even understand. There are times where people are experiencing things, their lives are touched by God, they're connected, they're seeing the answers to prayer. There are people who sense that nudge. I hear these stories, you guys. I mean, I hear people come up and tell me, hey, yeah, I was like, God just laid on my heart this, and then I did this, and then here's the response, because God, you know, God was nudging them what are they doing? Like, as God's nudging them and they're following that, that nudge, that leading of God, what do they, what do they experience? What are they knowing? God, right? I know God. I know God. There's a thirst for God. I know him. I think about Jesus Christ. And by the way, the more comfortable you are with things, the more you know things, the more comfortable you are. Like, I'm comfortable in a kayak. I've done it so many times. Put a camera in my hand. I am just super comfortable with it. Why? I'm, I'm familiar. There are certain trails. I can go down to Hell Hollow where there are no trails. Find my way to the furthest falls. I'm just, I've just done it so many times. I'm just comfortable. You just know your way. This is Jesus in his relationship with God when he was on earth. Like He just knows God. And I think about when he prayed that day when Lazarus was in the tomb. He prays God, bring him out, right? <clears throat> he knew it. Like He knew that God was going to raise Lazarus. He knew it. He was so confident. It wasn't like these conversations, like, the, hey, roll that tomb away. Hey, Lazarus, come out. Nothing happens. yoo Lazarus, buddy, can you hear me? I mean, Lazarus was up and out like that. Jesus Christ wasn't even worried about it. Jesus Christ talked about, hey, you guys, you know what? You don't even need to worry because God takes care of the birds of the air. He'll take care of you too. You don't even need to worry. Why? I mean, he knew God so much. He knew that. He knew, I don't have to worry about anything. I've got to do the best I can. God's going to take care of it. It's going to be okay, right? I know that. I know. I know this. And so I, I love how God is in the world, and God is protecting, and we know him, and we understand that he is true. And what are you going to invest yourself into? What are you going to invest emotionally into? Some of us get invested into football and sports. Like, we're seriously, like, emotionally invested into it. Some people are emotionally invested into making money and jobs and all kinds of stuff. What I'd like to suggest is God's true. He's a real deal. That's where I would invest. I would seek him. I would pray. And that's my encouragement to you guys today. Just seek Jesus Christ. He says eternal life is in him. Our relationship with God, it's all in him. It's all part of my faith in him. Seek him out. Because as we read these gospels, I've never found it to be super complicated. I just, I believe in certain things because of Christianity. I believe in helping people. I believe in what we're doing in Awana. I believe in forgiving and putting others, people first. I believe in what he said, you know, stay away from idols because they're not going to be, they're not real. Jesus, God's real. God's real. This is what he's saying. God's real. Idols, they're not real. I mean, believing in an idol, you guys, would be like driving a cardboard truck. It'd be like trying to pay your bills with Monopoly money. It's not going to do anything to you. And that's all these believing in stars and sitting on a rock until, you know, you get answers. Stop it. You know, you're, you're not going to find answers from pine trees. You're not going to find answers sitting on rocks. You're, not, you're just not going to. Is that, you never are. You're going to find answers with God. You're going to find answers with Jesus Christ. This is what I believe. So I would say my encouragement would be if you have questions today, 
pick up your Bible and read it. Read the book of John. Read the book of James. Just You seek it out. You don't have to just, because I'm saying stuff, I'm going to say, you do it. And anything that would take us away from God, we need to watch out for any idol. It could be pleasure, comfort, possessions, pride, any of that kind of stuff. It could be an idol in our lives. He's saying, stay away from that. There's one, one pursuit. You know, my life, uh, you know, I thought about it from the time I was young, and I think, I was trying to think back how I thought when I was younger. You know, I always wanted to do, you know, what God wanted me to do. Honestly, I don't think I ever had this thought of, hey, the world is lying in darkness per se, and God, you know, kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness, or God versus Satan. I think I thought of the world this way. What does God want me to do, and I don't care about the rest? I'm not, I'm not worried about the kingdom of darkness. I'm not worried about what everyone else is doing. I'm not worried about that. I just have to worry about one thing. What does God want? Right? At the end of the day, that's all it comes down to. What does God want you to do? Am I connected with him? Everything else is going to fall to place after that. So a lot of the stuff, like I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about these things. I'm going, to, I'm going to concern myself with one thing, knowing the true God. That's what I want to know through Jesus Christ and have eternal life through him. Let's stand as we close this time of prayer. Great Heavenly Father, I hope these things uh, all make sense and uh, come down uh, with us. And Lord, I, I really think about that the spirit, I mean, this righteousness you've put in to break these patterns of sin is just so amazing and that we can know you, the true God. It's amazing. And God, I want to. I want to keep seeking you out. And I want us as a church to just seek you out. And as people experience us, they're just going to sense that presence. Like these guys, they're, they're, they're heading in a certain direction. We've got somewhere to be. We've got somewhere to go. Help us with all these things, God. If there's somebody here who's never put their faith in you, I pray now be a time to call out and say, God, forgive me. Give me eternal life. Just pray it. Pray it out. And Lord, may we be committed this week to seeking you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.